Hi, everybody. I'd like to start by just asking you what you think comes to most people's minds when they think about refugees and why is that not working? Yeah. Um, probably something like this or maybe something like this or maybe something really scary like this. Well, today I'm going to tell you um, something about the other side of these images and I'm going to tell you about what I do and how I came to start. But first I'd like to introduce you to Hassan. So Hassan is a Hazara from Afghanistan and he came to Australia by boat at the age of 17 after his father was killed by the Taliban. Um, a lot of people complain about refugees arriving in Australia with a mobile phone. Um, Hassan arrived in Australia without a mobile phone and as a result he wasn't able to contact his mother or the rest of his family for five years. Um, so as you can probably imagine, when they finally had that phone call, it was a pretty emotional one. Um, he started off as a dishwasher here, and he ended up managing two restaurants. He now runs an organisation with his partner, Sammy, called Human Care Welfare, that provides assistance to hundreds of asylum seekers. Um, well, there are a lot of Hassans. As you probably know, we're currently witnessing the greatest refugee crisis in recorded history. Um, one in every 113 human beings on the planet is currently a refugee, displaced or an asylum seeker, um, which is 65 million people. That's, oh, I'm sorry, I've done it again. That's triple the population almost triple the population of Australia. It's a lot of people. Um, unfortunately, 87% uh, of these refugees are currently hosted in poor developing countries in um, Africa, the Middle East and South Asia. Um, and Australia takes 0.5%. Um, in 2014, I started working, uh, managing a college that delivered the government-funded adult migrant English program, and I met a lot of refugees for the first time in my life. Well, I have to tell you, they were really the sweetest people you would ever want to meet. Um, many of them were very shy and nervous when they first arrived. Many were quite traumatised, but as time went on, you could really see their strength and determination shining through. Um, they all, many of them had amazing stories and they'd all been through sort of incredible hardships and it wasn't easy for them to start a new life in Australia but one re thing that I kept seeing repeated was this feeling of gratitude to Australia for, for taking them in. Um, at the same time, the media in Australia was telling a very different story. There were a lot of stories about dull bludging refugees, about terrorists, refugees or possible terrorist refugees and our government um, was strengthening its program of offshore indefinite detention for asylum seekers and their children and they started using a lot of language which was sort of the language of invasion. They were talking about protecting our borders and about um, asylum seekers being illegal. And I think all of this language is very powerful and it started to affect the way that people were perceiving refugees. People started seeing refugees as being either dishonest or um, as being people to be feared in some way. And this kind of made me feel firstly kind of angry but also um, a bit worried about the possible effect of that on our society and also on the refugees themselves. So I used to think... What can I do? You know, it would be great if I could invite everybody to come to my college and sit down and have a chat with these people at lunchtime like I can and get to know them. You know, they'd see that all this fear-mongering is really rubbish. Um, and, then, you know, I was thinking, how can I try to achieve something like that? And eventually I had an idea, totally inspired by humans of New York, of um, telling these people's stories on social media. And that's how... New Humans of Australia was born. It's a project that tells these stories on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. So I'd like to tell you a few of these stories now, briefly. Uh, this is Zaki. 
He's also from Afghanistan, another Hazara from Afghanistan. He also came here by boat after his father was killed by the Taliban. And he recently won the uh, New South Wales International Student of the Year Award. This is Marie. She and her family had to flee Sierra Leone. Um, soldiers were going from city to city, murdering people and committing atrocities such as slicing over, open the bellies of pregnant women. Really terrible things. They went to a refugee camp where they lived for five years. She then came to Australia, went to high school, got her degree. She now works for Auburn Council. This is Rhoda, one of my favourite people. Uh, she had to, um, Soma war broke out in Somalia and she had to walk for 10 days with her younger siblings, carrying her younger two-year-old sister on her back the whole way to, uh, to get to safety. And um, one night um, they heard a lion roaring nearby and she told the other children to sort of calm them down. Don't worry, um, that's, that lion's a refugee just like us. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and um, she actually grew up to become a very famous poet in her country of Ogaden, which um, is no longer recognised. Uh, this is John, he's from South Sudan. He also grew up in a refugee camp. He came to Australia, I think, around 16, 17, worked really hard to get into uni, got a degree, couldn't get a job interview. <laughs> um, decided to get a master's, got an MBA, still couldn't get a job interview. When I met him, he was working at a meatworks in Toowoomba. Um, after I published his story, a lot of people contacted him to try and help him get work, including the National Australia Bank, who encouraged him to apply for their African Inclusion Internship Program, which he's applied for. So hopefully there'll be a good outcome for him. Uh, this is Pam and Harry. They're from Vietnam. Pam, um, had to, her father was a doctor who... Um, was killed by the communists for treating people that they didn't approve of. She and her family had to escape Vietnam by boat and um, they got lost at sea. And they ended up surviving by licking water off the boat when it rained. That was the only way they could get water. Uh, they now have a fish and chip shop in Nudgee Beach in Queensland. Um, but... Not surprisingly, Pam still doesn't like the water very much. This is Yasser. He's a student here at Sydney Uni. He's a PhD student. Um, his father came here by boat from Iran, and he's just developed a nanoparticle that could cure or treat stage 5 cancer. And this is Aya. She's from Iran. Her school used to be bombed all the time, but she loved studying so much she never wanted to stop going, and um, they didn't have any electricity in their house, so she used to creep up to the roof and wait for the dawn so she could start um, studying as soon as there was light. Um, she's now in her final year of dentistry here. This is Azeda. Uh, she's from I I Iraq as well, and um, her father was also executed when she was nine. It's a bit of a pattern. Um, she and her family ended up as illegal refugees in Greece and she was selling cigarettes on the street. Her brother was shining shoes. Uh, she now has a chain of fashion stores in Adelaide and uh, employs a number of people. Finally, I'd like to introduce you to Ibrahim. Uh, Ibrahim is from Palestine, but he grew up in a refugee camp in Syria after Jewish settlers... Uh, kidnapped his father and raised their farm to the ground. Uh, he now has a roller door company in South Australia that employs 35 people. And he says he doesn't want to retire because he doesn't want to stop giving back in this way to the country that took him in. Um, well, none of these stories are particularly unique. Um, you probably walk past people with stories like this every day. Um, as you may know, at the moment, a quarter of our population were born overseas and um, yeah, hi there. And almost half of us have a parent who was born overseas. And as we all know, uh, and I believe, we're all migrants in this country, with the exception of the Aboriginal people. Uh, 
Uh, and all this migration has, I think, created a really beautiful, complex culture. And there are a lot of people who live here who feel very grateful and who want to give back in some way. So I think rather than fearing these people, we should be applauding them and welcoming them with open arms. They've been through um, incredible, difficult lives and they achieve a lot here despite these handicaps. And personally, I think they should be our heroes. So I started this project uh, just over a year ago. And it's been a great year. I had no idea that, the, that it would become so successful. A lot of people have come forward to help me. Um, a lot of people have liked the Facebook page and a lot of people have written really beautiful, welcoming comments on the stories, which I have to say have been so appreciated by the interviewees. They often ring me up after their stories published and they feel very emotional and touched by, by what people have written. Um, for me, the best thing has been meeting all these people and hearing their stories. Uh, I feel kind of privileged to have been entrusted with these stories and to be able to pass them on. Um, we're currently transitioning New Humans of Australia into a not-for-profit organisation and we're seeking corporate sponsorship to help make that happen. Um, so, yeah, if you feel that you would like to be involved in that process, if you have any skills or expertise, please get in touch with me. My email address is on my website, newhumansofaustralia.com. Thanks very much. <laughs>